special meeting to order if everyone would please take their seats. Okay, this special meeting has been called by the Cambria Community Services District Board of Directors, the Standing Committees on Finance, Resources and Infrastructure and Policy, and the Pros Commission. The purpose of this meeting is Brown Act training. Um, before we start the training, I will take public comment on the agenda item, which is the Brown Act training. So if anybody wishes to speak, you can come up to this, raise your hand and come up to this microphone here when you're recognized. Does anybody have any public comment on this agenda item? Mr. Townsend, would you like to come to the microphone, please? Thank you. I printed this out big enough that I probably don't need my glasses, but I brought them just in case. Uh, good morning. My name is Jim Townsend. I'm a resident of Lodge Hill, and I serve on the policy committee. I'm hoping that the board and council can explain exactly why there seems to be currently such a big focus on the Brown Act. Uh, many of us recently received a detailed memo from the district council regarding the Brown Act. The memo was marked confidential, do not share, although there was nothing remotely confidential contained in the memo. That's being followed up by today's special meeting, again, focusing on the Brown Act. Uh, a casual observer could conclude that the real purpose of this focus is to limit interactions and discussions among elected and appointed officials. I find it curious, uh, given the district council's very expansive interpretation of what seems to be allowed to be discussed in closed session here at the CCSD, where the public is excluded. One need, no look, one need look no further than the agenda for tomorrow's special meeting for an example of this. The closed session agenda item for tomorrow's special meeting is titled Public Employment Pursuant to Government Code Section 54957, Title General Manager and Interim General Manager. You'll note that this title is not even a complete sentence. If the discussion relates to the position of the general manager or the advisability of creating an interim general manager position, it should be held in open session, not behind closed doors. If the discussion involves specific existing or potential individual employees, as could be inferred by the government code section cited, then that should be reflected in the agenda items title. Of course, no names need to be included. Tomorrow's meeting should be canceled, rescheduled, and if necessary, reposted with an appropriate and informative title. If indeed, this board is committed to improve communication with the public and actual transparency, it should limit closed session discussions to the very few topics that are allowed by law. If the board and its council are so concerned with strict adherence to the Brown Act, it should begin by modeling good behavior. Thanks for the opportunity to provide these comments and thanks very much for your service. Thank you. Just a comment on any of that? Uh, just just a, a quick comment and that is as far as the agenda description for tomorrow's meeting. Uh, as I'll touch upon, and I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail on closed sessions because as a practical matter, the uh, uh, committees and, and pros commission and, and, and so on. It's on, I, I mentioned to Haley that I'm not sure if this can be turned up or not. My, my voice tends not to carry very well, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, as, I'll t as I'll touch upon, uh, there is statutorily a provision in the Brown Act that contains uh, uh, what are called safe harbor in the business, uh, agenda descriptions, that if you do your agenda description in that fashion, you're deemed to substantially comply with the requirements of the Brown Act. And that's what we do. And while you might want more information regarding uh, tomorrow's closed session in that regard, uh, the, the agenda description is, is uh, satisfactory as far as what's required by the Brown Act. And, and I do know that there's some controversy regarding the closed sessions relating to the recruitment process. And I plan on touching on that uh, during my presentation uh, as, 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 as far as that issue. So. Thank you. Are there any more public comments? There's going to be a question and answer afterwards. Um, I don't know if that's a public comment. Um, Mr. Hirsch will be taking uh, questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you. Okay, if there's no other, uh, oh, Mr. Thomas, Director Thomas, would you like to come up and? So, uh, on an election, uh, 
Yes, uh, following that, uh, that question, are we going to have the opportunity to kind of ask questions on each slide as we go so we you know, can understand, or do you want us to wait until the very end? I, 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 my preference would be to do it at the very end, since I think it's going to be too disruptive of, as far as the uh, presentation. Uh, and, and I'm happy to respond to questions at the end. Uh, so if you could just save it for that, okay. that would be fine. Thanks. Thank you. No more questions or public comment. I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Hirsch for the presentation. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> again, my name is David Hirsch. I'm an attorney with Carmel and Nakasha, which serves as a legal counsel for the district. Tim Carmel, of course, is district counsel, and I work with him. Uh, in in uh, making this presentation, I have, have a couple of uh, uh, disclaimers or, or comments. And one is that I tend to be tied to my notes. So you'll have to uh, excuse me for that. Uh, when I do something like this, I don't do it very frequently. Uh, the other thing is we have uh, this PowerPoint presentation. And uh, I've done this presentation in Cambria a few times now in 2019, and then twice in 2021 through Zoom. And we used, I, I don't know where the original PowerPoint presentation came from. <laughs> and there's some issues, some things there that don't flow as well as I'd like. Uh, and then we've added stuff to it. Uh, you know, in 2021, I added uh, some slides relating to the new law regarding uh, social media. And this time around, I've added a couple of slides uh, relating to this AB 2449 and uh, teleconferencing rules, and also something about a new law relating to disruption of meetings and removing uh, people who are disruptive uh, from meetings that's now in the Brown Act. So we'll talk about that, but, but uh, uh, to the extent those, uh, we have this PowerPoint, I have no idea where it came from. Uh, as, <laughs> now, as I understand it, the reason we're doing this is because we have uh, a number of new members of boards and, 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 and so on that, uh, uh, and also on our on our board, but also on the committees and, and commission that uh, uh, might benefit from uh, having a Brown Act, pre Act presentation. And that's why I was asked to do it. I don't think anything nefarious is going on. The Brown Act uh, does exist. It does have a lot of twists and turns to it, as we'll discuss, that relate to what members of what are deemed legislative bodies, and you're all on what are called legislative bodies for purposes of the Brown Act, uh, have, to, have to adhere to. And, and so this kind of training is certainly appropriate. As far as myself, uh, I uh, have been a municipal attorney my entire career. I, I don't really represent private clients. I was an in-house uh, city attorney type for 31 years initially as a deputy and then the assistant city attorney in Simi Valley, then city attorney of Lompoc uh, for 17 years, then back to Simi Valley as city attorney for just under 11 years. Uh, and then for the last 14 years, I have worked part-time uh, with Carmel and Nakasha, call myself semi-retired, but I've had the privilege of working with a number of agencies throughout the region because uh, our firm represents Cayucas, and I do some work for Templeton, and, and uh, I've done some work for the city of Santa Maria, uh, and, and so on, and several other agencies over, over the time. Um, but I've been doing this for a while. Uh, the very first time I sat with the city council in, uh, it was 1979, I was a young deputy city attorney. We had some turmoil. The city attorney had been fired. Uh, the uh, city manager was also under fire, the assistant city attorney became the acting city attorney and I was, uh, she went on vacation and I was asked to sit with the city council. And you know, I, you know, I was a couple of years out of law school, I, I, I was pretty raw. And uh, the police chief looked at me and said, gee, I know you're nervous. Uh, so there's three, three answers to just about anything that's gonna come up. It'll cover you for 90% of the issues that are gonna come up at the meeting. 
He said, it's either gonna be a conflict of interest, a gift of public funds or brown egg violation. <laughs> so it wasn't exactly true, but uh, <laughs> that was my introduction to, to uh, doing, doing meetings and I've done a lot of them over the years. Uh, the Brown Act, and we, we'll go to slide two, is California's open meeting law. And that applies to, to public agencies. There's a counterpart called Bagley Keene that applies to state entities. I don't know much about it. I've, I've looked at it a couple of times. Uh, the purpose of the Brown Act, which has been on the books since 1953, so it's nothing new, is clearly stated in several provisions relating to legislative intent. One is uh, in 54950, it's not in the slide, the, the public commissions, boards, and councils, and the other public agencies in this state exist to aid in the conduct of the people's business, underline people, the people's business. It is the intent of the law that their actions be taken openly and that their deliberations be conducted openly. Uh, the principles behind the Brown Act, as well as the Public Records Act, have also been uh, enshrined in the state constitution based upon uh, Prop 59 in 2004. And uh, uh, the, uh, that, uh, Section 3 of Article 1 of the state constitution now provides the people have the right of access to information concerning the conduct of the people's business, again, that phrase, the people's business, and therefore the meetings of public bodies and the writings of public officials and agencies shall be open to public scrutiny. The basic premise is that the public has a right to know how their business is being conducted. As a practical matter, the Brown Act can be pretty frustrating to folks that are uh, on uh, legislative bodies, city councils, uh, boards of directors, committees, commissions, and so on. And the reason is because it limits the ability of a majority of those bodies to discuss agency business among themselves. Stuff that the phrase is within the subject matter jurisdiction of, of, of the entity. A uh, number of years ago, uh, I was involved in something called the Municipal Institute for the League of Cities and we organized some symposiums on different municipal law topics. And uh, we would have guest speakers as well. We would do these at uh, places like UC Hastings, which now has a new name, Stanford, UCLA Law School, and so on. And we did one one year, and Jerry Brown was our guest speaker. We'd always try to have a guest speaker. A couple of times we had state Supreme Court judges, justices. And it, this was when Jerry Brown was in between being the governor. He had been the governor, and at that time, he was the mayor of Oakland. And after the, his presentation, there was a break and a number of us city attorney types were all standing around talking to him. And he was going on and on about the Brown Act and how frustrated he was with it. Because when he was governor, he didn't have that same restriction where he could just talk to legislatures and, and put together deals and things like that. And we all kind of looked at each other and it was like this welcome to our world moment. You know. But nonetheless, its purpose is to ensure that deliberations and actions, with limited exceptions, are, are open to the public, and the public has the right to participate and have access to the decision-making process. Uh, I'm not sure what slide we're on. I'm not keeping up. So slide three, and now we can go to slide four, and I'm just going to read slide four if you'll indulge me for a moment. The people in delegating authority do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist on remaining informed so they may re retain control over the instruments they have created. And that's in government code section 54950. Uh, so who does it apply to? Obviously it applies to the board of, of directors. It applies to uh, city councils, you know, board of supervisors. It also provides to committees and commissions created by formal action of the governing body. Uh, you know, they can even be temporary in nature or just advisory in nature, but it, it applies to a broad range of uh, 
bodies that are under the act deemed to be, again, legislative bodies, even though you're not all legislating, you're considered a legislative body for purposes of the Brown Act. It applies to standing committees with regular uh, schedules uh, with continuing subject matter jurisdiction. It also, there's an exception for advisory bodies of less than a quorum of the legislative body. Uh, they, they, th those are bodies that don't have continuing subject matter jurisdiction. Uh, they're ad hoc committees and they're dealing with a specific topic and typically then would go out of existence once they've completed their tasks. Also, a critical part of the Brown Act, if we can go to slide six now, I guess we're up to, I'm not good at the slide thing, uh, is what is a meeting? Uh, it's a, really a critical part of, of, of the Brown Act. And meetings under the Brown Act are broadly defined. It's 54952.2 uh, of the government code. Any congregation of a majority of the members of a legislative body at the same time and location, including teleconference location, to hear, discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. So it includes not just making decisions, it includes hearing and discussing, deliberating, uh, the process of acquiring the information that's needed in order to make a decision. Uh, also, importantly, there's subsection B of that uh, 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 statute 54952.2 that prohibits a majority outside of an authorized meeting from using a series of communications of any kind directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action. Again, discuss is in there on any item of business within the agency's subject matter jurisdiction. And that statute is, is very important. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about its evolution because it's a relatively new addition uh, to the Brown Act in, in 2008. Uh, keep in mind that action taken is, is broadly defined. It's a collective decision by a majority, a collective commitment or, prop, or a promise or an actual vote. Uh, the, the phrase collective concurrence comes up a lot in case law and attorney general opinions. Uh, there are exceptions. And the exceptions include individual contacts between a member and another person. But remember, you can't use someone uh, as an intermediary to discuss, deliberate, or take action. Uh, and it's, it's kind of interesting because the problem of, often is appearances as well as actual violations. And we're dealing in an area where you know the public wants transparency and it's a question of of, of, of trust and so on. And you often get uh, folks who will see three board members together and assume that there's a violation. When I was a young deputy city attorney uh, sitting with the planning commission in Simi Valley, uh, I was given the task by the city manager and city attorney to talk to uh, three of the uh, planning commissioners because uh, the story was that after planning commission meetings, they were going out for drinks and talking business at the local bar. And uh, I had to approach them one at a time and talk to them. And some of them were, were quite upset and offended that I would suggest that and said, no, no, we're just, we're just talking sports. We're just talking about, you know, our work, but, you know, not, not, not the business of the, of the commission. But it's some of its appearances. I, something I've saved in my files for a long time. I, I was going through it and this is a picture from the Thursday, March 14th, 1991 Lompoc record. And it's a picture of three city council members standing by a fellow, Tim Staffel, who uh, was announcing his candidacy for uh, county supervisor. And Tim did serve a couple of terms on the Board of Supervisors. He's now a judge in Santa Maria. He hasn't retired yet. And at the top of this, someone had written, isn't this a Brown Act violation? Please look into this. And I got this in the mail anonymously as city attorney. And no, it wasn't a Brown Act violation. I mean, these were uh, three uh, 
you know, uh, politicians who are endorsing another politician, and that's obviously not within the subject matter jurisdiction of the body. But again, perceptions. Here's a picture of three council members standing with Tim Staffel, and I get this anonymous uh, uh, thing in the mail. Uh, th as it, there are exceptions, though. The exceptions include a majority attending a conference that's open to the public, like a CSDA conference or the League of California Cities. That doesn't mean that uh, the public can't be charged for attendance in the same way that uh, the uh, public officials are paying to attend, uh, but that is one of the exceptions. Another is an open and publicized community meeting organized by another organization like the Chamber of Commerce. It has to be public. Uh, I've seen this come up in the last year where there was a uh, 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 something being organized by a chamber of commerce, but it was not open to the public. And uh, we had to advise, no, a majority can't be there. Uh, also open meetings of another body like the board of supervisors uh, and social or ceremonial events. At the same time, the statute uh, provides that in all of these exceptions, a majority is not to discuss among themselves business with their, uh, within the subject matter of jurisdiction of the agency. So again, appearances are important. You know, three folks sitting together at, at say a board of supervisors meeting is probably not a good idea. Uh, there's also the issue of staff briefings. Uh, and are we on slide seven? We should be. Uh, slide seven does reference separate conversations by staff to answer questions, provide information, but staff uh, cannot communicate to members of the legislative body the comments or positions of any other member or members of the legislative body. And I wanted to spend a few minutes discussing how that law came into being because I think it provides some perspective on that section I mentioned that was added in 2008 regarding uh, serial uh, uh, communications outside of a meeting. Uh, initially, because that, that's a relatively recent codification of that principle. And before that, it was just implied, but it was not expressly in the Brown Act. There were older attorney general opinions, however, and you have to understand, attorney general opinions are pretty important. And when the attorney general issues an opinion, those opinions are, 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 are entitled to great weight by the courts and typically are followed by the courts unless they're clearly erroneous. Uh, there were a number of, of attorney general opinions, and, and the, the one, of, one of them uh, uh, created quite a stir among city attorney types, and that was where the question was whether uh, a city manager could brief council members two at a time, and then the, the, I guess one remaining one after that, the five-person body, and would that be a Brown Act violation? The attorney general said no, that would be what he called a seriata meeting and would be prohibited by the Brown Act. There was subsequently a case out of the city of Stockton where the uh, a city staff person contacted uh, uh, individual, made individual calls to council members uh, to get them to agree on something one at a time. And uh, the court said the Brown, it was a Brown Act violation. The city uh, attorney, it turned out to be, Jerry Sperry, was acting as an agent of the city violating uh, uh, the Brown Act because he was getting a collective concurrence uh, and therefore action was being taken. Uh, so uh, that's pretty much what we all lived with until a case came out in 2006, Wolf versus City of Fremont, that created qu quite a stir. The court there found that a city manager's individual meetings with council members to discuss uh, a new policy that was going to later be the subject of a uh, uh, a, a council meeting did not violate the Brown Act, and it's again implied. The court talked about the implied prohibition on serial meetings, <clears throat> saying he's saying it was only a violation if the city manager was uh, acting as a, a personal intermediary between the members, uh, so an agent, and they were using those uh, communications to develop a collective concurrence. Again, that collective concurrence language. Uh, so, and it's funny because what, what that brought to mind was uh, a number of years ago, 
1995, there were a lot of changes to the Brown Act and we had a city attorney's session uh, on the new Brown Act and you know a couple hundred people and some number of speakers. And uh, they talked about uh, some new language that made it clear that individual contacts were not a Brown Act violation. And, and a friend of mine who was city attorney of Santa Barbara at the time, Steve Americaner got up and said, staff are people too. <laughs> But I used to always caution the city manager in Simi Valley about, because he was very uh, uh, wont to uh, have these individual contacts and briefings with, with, with council members. And, and I was always cautioning him. And at, at, around that time, there was an attorney general opinion. I mean, I'm sorry, Orange County District Attorney Office opinion and memo that was sent out to all the agencies in Orange County that basically said that that kind of uh, briefing would be a brown egg violation. And so when I brought this new wolf case to the city manager's attention, he looked at me and said, see, I told you so. <laughs> but uh, like I said, it created quite a stir. And finally, uh, in uh, 2008, uh, July of 2008, Governor Schwarzenegger signed a bill into law SB 1732 that was specifically intended to be uh, a compromise between uh, 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 the guardians of, of uh, the public right to know, the, the media, which was very much lobbying to change this Wolf ruling, and public agencies, League of Cities and CSAC and so on were very involved in, in, the, in the lobbying. And what that ended up doing then was codifying this uh, section that I mentioned, the serial meetings that's now in there that prohibits a majority of the members of a legislative body, again, outside of a public meeting from using a series of communications directly or through intermediaries to discuss, deliberate, or take action on any item of business, any, any matter within the subject, any item of, within the subject matter jurisdiction of the agency. At the same time, part of that compromise was the language that expressly doesn't prohibit agency staff from engaging in separate communications or briefings with members of the legislative body outside of a meeting, but you can't, again, co communicate other members' comments or positions on, on the matter. So you have to be careful still, but, but it uh, did allow for that. So let's go to slide eight. You, so you pretty much have to avoid serial meetings uh, these are often referred to as daisy, daisy chain. You know, A talks to B, B talks to C, and before you have it, you have a, a serial meeting through these this series of communications, or or hope and hub and spoke, where a member contacts one and then contacts another and then contacts a third on a five member body, and and then you end up having a problem under the Brown Act. Now slides nine and 10, if we can go to nine, is the, uh, uh, relates to the new provision, relatively new in the Brown Act. It was uh, effective January 1st, 2021 that relates to social media. And it addresses communicating uh, on uh, internet-based social media platforms. Added uh, 54952B3, which provides that provisions in the, uh, Brown Act pro prohibiting a majority of members of the legislative body from using a series of communications directly or through inter intermediaries outside of an auth authorized meeting uh, to discuss, deliberate, or take action does not prevent a member of a legislative body from engaging and communicating on social media platforms to answer questions, provide information, solicit information from the public on a matter within the legislative body's subject matter jurisdictions. Those buzzwords come up a lot. However, a majority of the legislative body cannot use a social media platform to discuss business among themselves and discussing among themselves is broadly and kind of interestingly defined because it includes making posts, commenting and using digital icons that express reactions to communications made by other members of the legislative body. So emojis, thumbs up, likes uh, can, can create a problem. Also in slide 10, 
we'll see that there is an even stricter prohibition when it comes to social media. And that is a member of the legislative body is prohibited from responding to any communication on a social media platform regarding a matter within the subject matter jurisdiction that is made, posted, or shared by any other member of the legislative body. So this is a stricter standard since otherwise two board members on a five member body, for example, could talk to each other about something and it's not a violation. Uh, but here uh, it, it's a stricter standard and uh, it's a relatively new law. It's only been on the books a couple of years. I haven't seen anything relating to you know, uh, allegations of violations or things like that, but it's something to be aware of and to be careful with. So if we could move to slide uh, 11. And that is emails. Emails can also present a pro problem. You can't use them to collect, to uh, develop a collective concurrence. One, one way emails typically sent by staff informationally uh, type emails uh, are okay. And you'll often see an admonition in those emails that uh, the uh, member of the legislative body shouldn't uh, click uh, a reply all because reply alls can get you into a, a problem under the, the Brown Act. And there is an attorney general's opinion that says that emails can result in violations of the Brown Act. So you do have to be careful. Okay, so Let's see, slide uh, 12, I guess, types of meetings. Now, under the Brown Act, there are several types of kinds of meetings. You have regular meetings that occur on dates and times that are set by resolution, ordinance, or formal action of the legislative body, you know, adopting the uh, annual meeting schedule, things like that. Uh, you have, uh, have a requirement that there be 72-hour notice and posting requirements, and we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment, there are special meetings that can be called by the presiding officer or a majority of the board. This one, you'll see the agenda does reflect that it was called by the presiding officers. Can't be called by staff, but has to be called by again, the presiding officer or a majority of the board has specific notice requirements, 24 hour notice. Uh, you also have a provision that allows for emergency meetings where there is a need to take prompt action due to an actual or threatened dis disruption of public services. Uh, it has to severely Im impair public health, safety, or both. I've never actually seen that used, uh, but it's on the books if an appropriate circumstance comes up. Uh, I don't have a slide on this, but uh, there are <coughs> also provisions in the Brown Act, Brown Act relating to the fact that regular or special meetings can be adjourned to a specific time and place, uh, which is uh, then uh, has to be posted within 24 hours, uh, or, or if it's within less than five days, no additional notices are required. So, uh, good practices just to, if it's, if it's adjourned to then just post another uh, agenda similar to a special meeting notice. But in any case, uh, you can have adjourned uh, meetings, regular meetings and, sp and special meetings. Same thing for public hearings, they can be adjourned to a specific time and place. Uh, there are also provisions in the Brown Act relating to where uh, meetings can be held. Generally, regular and special meetings have to be held within the uh, territory over which the agency has jurisdiction, so the boundaries of the Cambridge Community Service District. Uh, there was a flap a couple of years ago uh, with the South County Sanitary District that got a little uh, press where they held a closed session to do uh, video interviews with candidates for the general manager position at the embassy suites in, in San Luis Obispo at a conference room saying, well, you know, they have nice video equipment and a big screen and it's like, yeah, you can't set up a TV in a conference room at the district and do it that way. And they ended up redoing their meeting and redoing their interviews because <laughs> they got called on it. Uh, there's also uh, exceptions to comply with a state or federal law or court order or to attend a judicial or administrative proceeding that the agency is a party uh, in. And I'll tell you how I use that once. 
uh, to inspect real or personal property that can't be brought into the boundaries of the agency. Uh, but such meetings are limited to things relating to the property. Uh, to participate in multi-agency meetings, but it has to be held within the boundaries of one of the uh, participating agencies and all of the agencies have to give notice, post notices for that meeting. Uh, there's also another one uh, that in, involves a meeting at the Office of Legal Counsel for a closed session on pending litigation when to do so would reduce legal costs or fees. And in 2004, I used that section along with the one about attending uh, proceedings, a legal proceeding, when Simi Valley had a case at the US Supreme Court. It was a police related case, Mueller versus Mena, uh, 5 4 decision. It was one of Rehnquist's last uh, decisions. And we had quite a contingent, cities, you know, cases rarely get taken up by the Supreme Court. They have thousands and thousands that are petitioned to them, and they, you know, they hear about 80 cases a year now. And we hired a fellow, uh, Carter Phillips, who I think now has argued 80 or 90 cases at the US Supreme Court to represent the city in that case. It was a, a police related case. So we had three council members that wanted to attend. Our police chief went, the two police officers who were involved in the case, our city manager, our assistant city manager, one of the assistant city attorneys, my daughter who lived in Florida at the time flew up so she could attend the, the oral argument. And uh, we met at Carter Phillips's office the day before the oral argument uh, to go over the, uh, uh, the strategy in the case, the, the you know, a draft of the argument, that kind of thing. And uh, we post, we, we actually posted a notice and agenda uh, regarding uh, uh, that uh, meeting uh, and, and citing those exceptions under the Brown Act. And I remember uh, a month or two after uh, the oral argument, which was in uh, December of uh, 2004, I was at a luncheon, uh, you know, public agency attorneys luncheon. They had a group in Ventura County. And uh, I was sitting next to the deputy district attorney who handled their, what they call their public integrity unit, which deals with Brown Act violations and conflict of interest and so on. Most DA's offices have those kind of uh, uh, staffs in their office. And uh, I told him about what we had did and done rather and how we posted the agenda and so on. And he was impressed, <laughs> he did it right. Uh, Next, I want to talk a little bit about teleconferencing, Zoom meetings, and so on that we've all gotten so used to. Uh, and th there's a new statute, uh, uh, AB uh, uh, 2449, that keeps coming up, keeps getting mentioned. I think it's of limited utility, but we'll talk about it for a moment. And also kind of how we got to where we are uh, with this whole concept of, of remote meetings and Zoom meetings. Uh, First, as a result of COVID, uh, the governor initially issued an executive order suspending uh, some of the Brown Act requirements uh, with some sp specific things that were required, which basically led to all the Zoom meetings that we, we got used to. Uh, <clears throat> this was followed by AB 361, which added specific provisions to the Brown Act 549 Five three subsection E that permitted remote meetings under certain circumstances. Uh, you had to uh, determine that there was an imminent risk to health and safety to attendees, you know, usually making findings through a resolution. You had to renew that every three years that those conditions continued to exist. And also this law, which is still on the books, can only be used during a declared state of emergency. And we're not talking about a, a local emergency that is declared by say the county or something like that. Uh, there's no provisions for the, uh, a district like Cambria to, to declare an emergency, but there, there is for cities and counties. It has to be a statewide emergency that's declared by the governor, which we had in place. So subsequently, Governor Newsom announced in late uh, uh, 2022 that the COVID state of emergency would end on February 28th, 2023, which is what has happened. And so now we're back to uh, doing in-person meetings. And uh, you know, keep in mind, this relates to the legislative body, not to 
staff, for example, attending remotely or a consultant, uh, you know, uh, being through Zoom or the public. And a lot of agencies are starting to do hybrid meetings using that term uh, because it actually provides greater access for the public when it comes to being able to not just observe, but participate in, in, in public meetings. So that's a good thing. Uh, but since there's no state of emergency in California at this point in time, although there could be in the future, what's left are what we might call traditional teleconferencing rules and a new law that uh, took effect January 1st, 2023, this year, AB 2020, 2449. So slide 13. Uh, and th this covers the, again, traditional teleconferencing rules. And uh, it has certain specific requirements. Votes need to be by roll call. Teleconferencing location has to be on the agenda and the meeting notice. Each location has to be accessible to the public. A quorum has to be participating within the agency's boundaries. And the public has to be given the ability to address the legislative body at each teleconference location. Uh, I'll be honest, in all the years I was an in-house city attorney, and that was before Zoom, of course, uh, I rarely saw this ever used. Now, I was the attorney for several oversight boards. I'm not sure if you're familiar with what that is. It, was, it all relates to the wind down of redevelopment after that was kind of eliminated in 2011 by legislation spearheaded by, by Governor Brown. Uh, and there were these oversight boards created to deal with the things that were left over from redevelopment, like property that had been acquired and things like that, various agreements that had been entered into. And I've sat with several oversight boards, Pismo Beaches and Arroyo Grandes and Santa Maria's. The composition of these legislative bodies uh, were uh, uh, statutory in nature, and a couple of the members were appointed uh, by the Board of Supervisors. And the Santa Maria Oversight Board, uh, the two members who were appointed by the Board of Supervisors preferred to meet in Santa Barbara uh, tele telephonically rather than drive all the way up to Santa Maria. And so we would structure those meetings uh, through this traditional provision that allows for te teleconferencing and has been on the books for a long time. And they would post the agenda and do it in a conference room at the county building in Santa Barbara. And the public would, you would always ask it, any from the public want to comment on this matter and so on. Uh, so it does exist. It, it can be used. I know of another agency that we represent that seems to be using it uh, uh, fairly frequently for one of their board members complying again with all these restrictions. AB 2449 was added, uh, it added a new section 54953 subsection F. And it has some limited and very complex requirements that allow for a uh, uh, teleconference meeting without complying with uh, the posting of agendas at, uh, at each location, public access, including the agendas on the uh, locations on the agenda requirements that are in 54953B, which is the traditional uh, uh, teleconferencing provision. Uh, but it's very complicated. And when I, I, you know, I tried to put a PowerPoint provision together and, and kind of struggled with it and had way too much stuff in it. And uh, someone in, in our office helps clean everything up after I mess, mess up the, the PowerPoint. And she broke it into two slides. So we have uh, 14 and 15 here. And uh, also, I guess you have it in your packets. It's complicated and very limited. And I don't think it's particularly useful. And I don't think it's going to get used that much. It, it requires either just cause, and that, that's the term it uses, and defines it, you know, child care, caregiving, contagious illness, physical or mental disability, travel while on official public business, or what are defined to be emergency circumstances, which uh, would be a physical or family medical emergency that prevents in-person attendance. And just cause 
uh, under that exception, uh, there's a requirement that the member notify the legislative body at the earliest opportunity of a need to re participate remotely. And uh, there's a further limitation that it can only be used twice in a calendar year by that board member. And uh, then for emergency circumstances, that requires uh, a request to be made to the legislative body and that body then has to take action to approve it. And among the changes, in addition to adding this section to 54953, there's another section was amended that relates to things not on the agenda that are allowed to be dealt with. And so there's a provision that allows this to be dealt with when there's a request under this emergency uh, uh, circumstance exception. There, in addition to that, and see this, this, this statute is very poorly written in, in my opinion, but in addition to this express, you can only use it twice for just cause, there's an additional section limiting how many times it can be used by the member uh, no more than three consecutive months or 20% of the meetings of, uh, in a calendar year, or if the body meets less than 10 times a year, they uh, can only participate remotely, remotely for only two, um, no more than two meetings. So it's very complicated. There are additional requirements that are set out in the, in the slide. You have to provide two-way communications, either audio or, or telephonic. Uh, you have to uh, provide a call-in uh, internet uh, option on the agenda. If there's a disruption uh, in terms of the uh, telecommunication aspect, uh, you have to uh, uh, stop doing business until it's been uh, been restored. You have to disclose any people that are over 18 years of age or older that are in the room with the board member and what their relationship is to the board member. So it's, it's a, an interesting statute and we keep getting questions about it as if it's something that's a panacea when it comes to being able to participate remotely and and uh, in my view, and I think in Tim's view, it's, it, it's not something that uh, is going to be that useful going forward. But it's there. Um, <clears throat> moving along, we got uh, slide 16. This is what my notes say. I'm going to talk a little bit about agendas and posting. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, for regular meetings, there's a 72 hour posting requirement. Agendas are required to contain a brief general description of the business to be transacted or discussed. Uh, the statute actually says a brief general description of an item generally need not exceed 20 words. I tend to be very wordy myself uh, when it comes to agenda descriptions, but the idea is to put the public on notice of what business is to be transacted so they can decide whether they want to attend or not or view the meeting or participate in some fashion. The uh, it, it's it's kind of interesting because there have been a few cases in recent years where the courts seem to be taking a st fairly strict view of of these uh, agenda descriptions. This last September, there was even a case out of the city of Thousand Oaks. It had to do with uh, a uh, uh, refuse collection contract, and the lawsuit was brought by uh, a competing vendor. And uh, it, it challenged the decision on the basis that the agenda description did not include the fact that the board was also making a finding, or the city council rather, was also making a finding that the contract and some changes to the ordinance were exempt uh, from CEQA, which is a routine thing that agencies do. And uh, they said because it was not specifically on the agenda that they would make that finding, that was a violation of the, uh, the uh, Brown Act. That case about three or four weeks ago was depublished by the state Supreme Court. There was a petition for hearing. They denied the petition, but they depublished the case, which is one of the techniques that they use sometimes to basically make something no longer precedent. So, so that case no longer uh, is uh, a hindrance to having an agenda uh, item that doesn't include the fact that there is a uh, 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 finding as part of the decision making of exemption, uh, being exempt from CEQA. That's different from making a finding uh, 
uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, other kinds of CEQA findings and determinations, but not the exemption. Agendas also have to uh, have uh, the date and time and location of the meeting, uh, things like that. Uh, so in any case, uh, uh, in 2019, there was also uh, some specific provisions added to the Brown Act relating to websites, which most agencies now have, and uh, formats for po uh, posting agendas uh, on the website required uh, where they have to be in terms of finding it on the, the website. Uh, uh, most agencies already were doing that in some form, and this got more specific. They have to be accessible through a prominent link, have to be searchable, downloadable, things like that. So there's these specific requirements relating to uh, uh, websites, uh, given all the technology we have now. Uh, slide 18, uh, if we could look at that, that's uh, special meetings. Special meetings, again, can be uh, have to be called uh, by uh, the presiding uh, uh, officer or a majority. We kind of talked about that a little bit already. Uh, the agenda is similar to regular meetings other than you don't have to have an item allowing public comment on things that are not in the agenda. Some agencies do that anyway, but uh, you don't have, uh, have to have the uh, a public comment on, on matters not on the agenda, uh, item on the agenda, just a, an item that basically provides for comment on the agenda items uh, for the special meeting. And again, staff cannot call special meetings. Okay, uh, slide 19. Now there are <coughs> provisions in the Brown Act that protect the right of the public uh, to attend, observe, and participate in, in meetings. They can't be required to register their names or provide other information. It can be voluntary, uh, but uh, you can't require that. Uh, the public has a right to review agenda materials, uh, that, things that are not privileged, like a, a confidential memo from the city at, uh, attorney or district council. Uh, but uh, also when, when uh, they have been distributed to a majority of, of the board, they have to be made available to the public, things like that. Um, let's see, slide 20. There are also several provisions in the Brown Act that address matters that are not on the agenda. And also members of the legislative body uh, responses to, th uh, to things that are not on the agenda or comments or questions from the public. Uh, they can briefly respond uh, to things that are not on the agenda. Uh, even without public comment, uh, a, a board member uh, can request info or member of the legislative body can request information, uh, request uh, a report back on something, place a matter on the agenda for a subsequent meeting, subject to the local rules, of course, make a brief announcement or briefly report on his or two his or her activities. Uh, there often will be those kind of items on agendas. Uh, uh, as a regular agenda item, you know, re uh, board member reports, that kind of thing. Uh, in Simi Valley, we used to have that, and we had a council member that would always make me nervous because he would uh, say he was things like, I just want to get uh, the council's reaction to this. And uh, of course, then other council members would start to chime in, and you can't really discuss it. And it's kind of difficult when you're the city attorney and those are your bosses and you only have one client. You know, you work full time for the city. <laughs> you don't want to upset them too much. Uh, so uh, the city manager and I used to have a little act we would do where I'd start to lean forward in my chair and he would kind of look at me and say into his microphone, David's getting nervous. <laughs> and I told that story a year or two ago at a council meeting where I was sitting in for Tim in Arroyo Grande, uh, <laughs> with, where the, they were getting into too much of a discussion uh, regarding something that was not on the agenda, because there's a great temptation to do that, and you can only let it go so far. <laughs> Sometimes you have to just chime in and say, you know, it might be good to put this on a future agenda. Uh, anyway, 
there are exceptions uh, when it comes to uh, things that aren't on the agenda. And I mentioned there was this new provision relating to AB 2449. In addition to that, the, the important one is uh, uh, an exception that allows the uh, legislative body by a two thirds vote, or if there's less than two thirds in attendance, then by uh, all the members in attendance to determine that there's a need for immediate action uh, and the need to take immediate action came to the attention of the agency subsequent to the posting of the agenda. And that does come up from time to time with that 72 hour requirement in particular relating to uh, uh, regular, regular uh, uh, meetings. And uh, so you have to make that finding, that determination based upon those facts and circumstances before you then can take up the item and, and make a determination on it. Okay, so we're up to slide 22, I think. Uh, again, right to comment. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, you have to allow the public to speak on any, on regular agendas on any item of interest, so long as it's within the subject matter jurisdiction of the legislative body. These are often you know, called public comment or citizen input uh, on an agenda. Uh, can be kind of confusing too for the public when uh, the, the legislative body really doesn't do much other than refer it to staff uh, or something like that, because there are a lot of folks that don't pay a lot of attention to what their uh, local agency bodies are doing. Uh, they could care less, but suddenly they have a grievance or an issue and they decide they're going to go down to the you know, board meeting, the city council meeting, and we're going to get this taken care of by God. And they get up during uh, public comment and they, they state their problem and uh, you know, the, the board thanks them and maybe makes a little comment or two, but obviously can't take action on it. And a lot of agendas will have on the agenda uh, some language that clarifies that uh, no action can be taken on matters that aren't on the agenda and things like that just to to cover that issue because because people sometimes uh, really don't understand that, that that's the case. Uh, the public also has a right to speak on specific items of business on the agenda before or during the board's consideration of, of, of it. This was a big topic of discussion a couple of years ago when I did my Brown Hack presentation in 2021 uh, was the, the issue of the day at that, at that time. Uh, uh, today, I guess it's the uh, closed sessions on the general manager recruitment. And, but, but that was uh, something that was talked about quite a bit at that time. And the requirement is to allow comment before or during the board's consideration. It's really a policy question if the board wants to entertain additional comments uh, beyond uh, what it allows uh, within that statutory requirement. Uh, the Brown Act uh, does allow reasonable regulations, including time limits. You can have an overall time limit on how much time you're going to allow to an, uh, a topic or item on the agenda, or uh, time limits uh, for, for individual speakers. Three minutes is typical. Three minutes was upheld in, in an appellate case. Uh, out of the city of Long Beach a couple of years ago. Uh, the Brown Act also specifically says that the legislative body cannot prohibit public criticism of policies, procedures, programs, or services of the agency or the acts or omissions of the board. Comes with the business, comes with the territory. Um, also, there's reference on the slide to disruptions. I want to talk about that a little bit. There's a new statute relating to that. Uh, this is something that can come up from time to time. You often have very heated in, uh, items on the agenda. I've attended many meetings where it's a full house and you have a very large crowd of angry and upset people or Half the people are there in favor of something and half the people are there opposed to that same item. You know, it would come up a lot in planning matters. And uh, it contains some specific provisions relating to disturbances in a new law, uh, SB 1100, that added a new provision 54957.95 to the Brown Act. Uh, under this new statute, the presiding member of the legislative body 
can have an individual removed for disrupting a meeting, which is defined in the statute. First, there has to be a warning that the behavior is disrupting the meeting. And if they don't cease immediately, uh, that behavior can then result in removal. And then if they don't promptly uh, cease behavior, they can be removed from the meeting. Uh, disruptive behavior is defined as behavior that disrupts, disturbs, impedes, or renders infeasible the orderly conduct of the meeting. The Brown Act has other provisions relating to disruptions. Another one in particular that speaks more in terms of disruptions by a group or groups of persons. You can clear the room uh, and reconvene, only allowing the press back in or certain individuals. I've never really seen that used. Uh, and uh, more frequently, we, we would have scripts that we would use and we would give the presiding uh, officer, the mayor, or whoever, basically suggesting, you know, you know uh, indicate that, you know, disrupting the meeting is also a misdemeanor under the penal code, penal code section 403, and uh, uh, that it, uh, it's unlawful, and we're going to take a break, and everyone calm down, and we'll reconvene. That usually worked. I mean, in Simi Valley, we used to have, uh, you know, we had some some pretty serious controversies. And uh, in anticipation of those, we'd have you know, a couple of uniformed police officers stand in the back of the room. Uh, we had the luxury of the police department you know, being part of the city and uh, uh, the police station was next door to city hall. <laughs> so that helped. Obviously it's more difficult in terms of how are you gonna remove someone from a meeting if they don't wanna be removed. There are also cases involving uh, prosecutions under Penal Code Section 403. There are federal civil rights cases at the Ninth Circuit involving those kind of circumstances where people have been removed from meetings for allegedly being disruptive, saying it violated their First Amendment rights. Uh, and and uh, uh, there's some fairly detailed court cases on the do's and don'ts in terms of local policies and procedures. One of my favorite cases I was telling Karen at, before the meeting was one involving a school board where a fellow was prosecuted under penal code section 403 for disrupting a school board meeting when he dumped a bunch of bags full of trash on the floor and was ranting and raving about, this is all the junk that your students that live, that, that they're going to the school near where I live are leaving on my, ha at my property. <laughs> But, and he claimed then his prosecution was a, a violation of his constitutional right to free speech. I believe the uh, prosecution was upheld. Uh, as mentioned, I think we're in slide 24, and I think we have a little, uh, yeah, a little uh, duplication here, what we talked about a little bit, because the Brown Act does have a provision regarding board members responses to public comments not on the agenda, brief response to statements and, and so on, and no action uh, or discussion is permitted, referring to staff, that kind of thing. I guess I'm not quite sure whether where the, the these uh, slides came from, and maybe I should have cleaned that up or removed that one. Now we're up to closed sessions. Let's, let's go to uh, 25. And I, I was really only gonna touch on this uh, since it's not something that you know, the Finance Committee, Policy Committee, R&I, the Pros Commission, are likely to have occasion to really hold a closed session. Uh, but one of the tensions that's obvious in this law relating to requiring open meetings and doing things in public is that there are legitimate reasons that you can't do everything in public. And there's the need to have closed sessions. And these are very limited and have to be within the statutorily, statutorily authorized uh, closed session uh, items that are, are specifically set out in the law. Uh, just because something is sensitive, embarrassing, or controversial doesn't permit it to be discussed behind closed doors, unless it's in, within one of those authorized uh, exceptions. Also, it's important to keep in mind that information acquired in a closed session is not to be disclosed unless authorized by the legislative body. 
And sometimes you get into circumstances where there are allegations that there's someone who's leaking information uh, you know, from uh, closed sessions. We had a situation in, in Lompoc where we had a uh, very pro-union uh, uh, person on the council. We were in negotiations with a different union, not his. He didn't work for the city, and, but he was a pro-union guy and uh, that was his world. And then uh, there was information being, uh, we thought leaked to the union representatives in negotiations for a new contract. And it can get sticky. There's some provisions in the Brown Act that address that. They're kind of difficult to deal with, not real useful or substantive. You can even refer someone to the grand jury. It could be considered to be misconduct that gives rise to other kinds of violations. Now, as I mentioned earlier, I'm aware that there's discussions and concerns about the closed sessions relating to that general manager recruitment, what's happening tomorrow. Uh, Legally, and in my professional opinion, uh, uh, Tim's, uh, those closed sessions are ju justified and within case law and attorney general opinions that are applicable uh, to that. There are actually uh, 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 attorney general opinions and, and there's a case that cites favorably to this particular attorney general opinion that involved interviews with uh, candidates for appointments uh, by a legislative body. Uh, and the court recognized that, you know, qualifications of staff interviewing candidates, discussing qualifications are, are uh, within the exception to the Brown Act. Uh, they talk about privacy rights of individuals interested in the position. And this is a very common practice and, and is done statewide. And in my own experience, as a, as a, uh, a person applying for city attorney jobs, I had interviews by city councils in closed sessions. And as far as the confidentiality, uh, a lot of times when folks apply for a job, they don't want their current employers to know they're applying for another job. They don't want to send the wrong message to their current employers that they're le looking to leave. I personally did that. I would put in my cover letter with my application to be city attorney somewhere else uh, that, uh, uh, I wanted my having applied to be kept confidential until mutual interest has been established. That was the phrase I would use. So it's, it's very common. And you can, you know, you know I, I can certainly understand and appreciate uh, that there are people who disagree with the notion that these things should be done in closed session, that the public should know that they should be part of the process. They should be part of this, you know, uh, knowing what the questions and developing the questions they're going to be asked and, and, and so on. Well, obviously, if, if the questions are, are developed in public, then uh, it allows those candidates to prepare their answers in advance, not be spontaneous. There's, there are legitimate reasons that I think you need to be mindful of when it comes to any of these closed sessions, because you can always do any of these things publicly, uh, but you don't want to undermine, undercut the underlying rationale for why something is allowed to be done in closed session. Negotiating for property, obviously, you don't wanna instruct your negotiators publicly on how much they're gonna pay or how much they're gonna uh, pay in, uh, you know, for a lease because leases are, are, are permitted too. Same thing with negotiating with represented or unrepresented employees. Uh, you know, to the, uh, do so publicly would, have the uh, potential of undermining the district's interests in, in the subject matter that's, that, that's at hand. Uh, so anyway, I just wanted to talk about that a little bit more than I intended to uh, when it came to closed sessions, since again, those are not something that uh, the committees and, and pros commission and so on are, are going to, uh, for the most part, be holding. Now, there are se several types of closed sessions and you know, personnel, you know, we're starting to hear uh, uh, some, some talk about it. We have slide 26. If, okay. Uh, uh, and it also includes uh, uh, employment, of employee evaluations. It includes uh, uh, closed sessions for dismissal, uh, charges brought against an employee. That one's kind of interesting because it also includes uh, the right of the employee to be given notice and an opportunity to have those charges 
uh, discussed publicly. Now, I don't know why an employee would do that, but I've had occasion to have to comply with that requirements and give the employee notice uh, so that they can take advantage of that if they, they wish to do so. There are also some very specific provisions in the Brown Act relating to pending litigation. What constitutes pending litigation? Uh, very specific uh, language as it relates to closed sessions uh, re relating to potential litigation uh, where there's a threat, for example, made at a public meeting, that, that's an easy one. If it's a threat of litigation uh, to staff, you know, say someone you know, calls up Ray and says, I'm gonna sue you over this, then uh, we would have Ray make a contemporaneous uh, memo of that uh, threat, and that would have to be made public uh, uh, before being able to hold a closed session where you would have to list that as the exception, that, that section number on the agenda. As I mentioned, there are very specific provisions in the Brown Act, uh, these safe harbor provisions that are followed statewide uh, as far as the agenda description for closed sessions. And then there's other provisions allowing closed sessions where there's uh, a uh, uh, facts and circumstances that constitute uh, potential litigation against the agency. And uh, uh, if it's known to the other party, you have to list those specific facts and circumstances on the agenda or announce them publicly so you don't have to have a narrative. You, the district council could just explain that before going into closed session. So there's some very specific things where you can help closed sessions also to consider initiation of, of litigation by the agency, which comes up from time to time. Uh, it all, there's also closed sessions relating to real property negotiations, labor negotiations, slides 28, I guess we're at, that uh, and 29. Uh, those require disclosing the property, for example, for property negotiations, as well as who your negotiator is and who they're negotiating with. Uh, there's also closed sessions permitted for uh, public uh, security. Uh, we did that in Simi Valley after 9-11. Uh, we had a closed session where the police chief then briefed the city council on steps that were being taken to protect uh, the city's in infrastructure, water facilities, you know, things like that. So uh, let's see. Okay, under violations, uh, slide 27, I guess. I don't see anything on the screen, but <laughs> there are provisions in the Brown Act, civil and criminal uh, uh, penalties, actions relating to Brown Act violations. Criminal, it's a misdemeanor to attend a meeting where action is taken in violation of the Brown Act where the member has uh, intends to deprive the public of information to which the member knows or has reason to know the public is entitled to. So it's a specific intent crime and action has to be taken. Uh, there are additionally uh, provisions in the Brown Act where the district attorney or individuals can bring a civil action to uh, uh, and get a judicial determination as to whether there's been a Brown Act violation. It requires that there be uh, a written demand to cure and correct uh, and uh, a process then, you know, cease and desist. Those are the terms that are used in the statutes. And, uh, you know, actions can be held void and, and null and void by a court. You might have to do something over again. Uh, and uh, it comes up from time to time. We had something come up in 2021 where the district attorney uh, wrote the district uh, uh, asserting that a closed session was not properly held. We believed it was, we explained why, and they ended up withdrawing their cease and desist letter that they had uh, uh, sent. Uh, but it does come up from time to time. And in addition to folks in the community that carefully watch what an agency is doing. There are some folks in San Luis Obispo County that seem to watch every agency 
and what they're doing and will seek to uh, uh, make sure everyone's doing things correctly when it comes to the Brown Act. Uh, just a few miscellaneous things. Uh, the act applies to newly elected officials who have not, not yet assumed office. So when after an election, you always have to caution folks uh, to be careful about, about the Brown Act and give them a little information. Members of legislative bodies cannot act by secret ballot. So there's not no filling out slips and passing them up to the presiding officer with your vote, yes or no. Votes have to be taken publicly. And also uh, members of the public have to be permitted to make audio or video recordings unless to do so would disrupt the meeting. Of course, everyone has their cameras on their phones now with video capabilities and it's very common for folks to wanna record meetings. I remember in Simi Valley, there was this flap over something and I think uh, someone thought it would be a good intimidation tactic to, to set up a camera and also have a court reporter sitting in the front of the room <laughs> doing the whole thing. They could have gotten a tape of the meeting. It was, it was, anyway, so that's basically the presentation. <laughs> and if you've attended one of these before, you probably heard the stories I told more than once. <laughs> and uh, I'm happy to try to respond to any questions. Keep in mind, I'm, I'm not a Brown Act expert. I'm a generalist. Municipal law is such a varied area. One minute you're dealing with employment matters, the next, you know, public contracts, the next you're dealing like for cities with something like adult business regulation or mobile home rent control, both of issues that I dealt with in my career. And so it, you never know what's gonna come up. That's part of the fun. And there's always a new law or a new controversy or something you've never done before that, that you get to do. Anyway, uh, I don't know if we wanna have people come up to the microphone. Is that how we're doing this? Either way is fine. I, I, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Ted Key, uh, Cambria. A couple of questions, actually. Um, now, standing committees are a little bit different than the board, obviously, because the board is the actual legislative body and the standing committees are advisory um, in capacity. Um, I'm assuming that all the open re re meeting requirements are the same regardless. Is yes. that right? For purposes of the Brown Act, for purposes of the, Brown Act. the standing committees are, quote, legislative bodies because okay. they're formally created and appointed uh, by the board. Okay, well, I guess even, that's if, a... even if it was a temporary committee that was formed to advise on a particular matter, uh -huh. uh, that would be subject to the Brown Act as well. Okay. And my second question is actually um, uh, the business of um, being able to, to zoom in under a, an emergency or some sort of circumstance. Let's just say, for example, so I was looking at this, let's just say, for example, that someone on a committee, um, you know, hurts themselves you know, a couple of days before a meeting and um, the business of being able to actually travel to the meeting or participating in a physical way is uh, um, not recommended or prohibitory in, a, in some way. Um, that might pose a problem for getting approval from the actual legislative body to, to participate in the meeting. Um, it, it, it appears that they have up until the meeting begins or even when the meeting begins to, to state the purpose for their uh, yeah, request to participate remotely within within the confines yeah, they're, of the they're county, supposed of course. to provide information regarding it. Well, I think the, the statute also speaks in terms of not requiring specific medical, you know, that kind of thing. But yeah. you have to at least provide the circumstances and justification for the uh, legislative body to 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 make a determination and then again, there's a new exception to things not on the agenda, but I think the uh, requirement also is to bring it to the attention of, of the body as, uh, as soon as possible. And we'll see how useful this, this is because it's, well, it's very complicated and convoluted yeah. and, 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 and uh, my, my, I'm my not question, sure how it's gonna work in practice. Yeah, well, my question is, you know, if, if the individual, uh, if the proximity of the uh, of the um, 
uh, injury or whatever we want to call it, uh, kind of is um, so close to the meeting time that it makes it impossible to actually get uh, to the legislative body to 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 offer approval for that. Um, you know, you're sort of in a you're sort of in a uh, between a rock and a hard place. Um, so, is it acceptable, for example, let's say, you know, um, uh, you know, I've got a meeting tomorrow or the next day and I just broke my leg. Okay. I think it's going to be very fact specific. So I mean, can I go to that meeting via, via zoom and, and, and say to the people in that meeting, I'd like to be included in the quorum today, but I can't be there because obviously, you know, I broke my leg. I think you're going to have to convey the circumstances to the agency and to the board, to the board, you know, chairman, to staff as soon as possible. Okay. And then at the beginning of that meeting, the uh, uh, body would then have to make a determination based upon those circumstances that it fits into the emergency exception, for example under government code section 54953F. So which body <laughs> is making that determination? Would it be the, the actual, let's say, standing committee that yes. would make that decision? Yes. Or would it have to be the board itself that no, makes it's it? the body. So in other words, an individual could inform the, the actual, I'm just using it, the individual could inform, could inform the board of this special circumstance and then come to the meeting and get approval to attend vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the, the meeting members. The statute does seem to allow that. Again, it's fact specific in terms of circumstances. Sure. And other things that would also have to be uh, adhered to in terms of what the statute uh, requires in terms of the communications device, Zoom, whatever, the uh, 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 issue of identifying who else in the room is, is over 18. I mean, we'll have to see how this it works in practice. Uh, Keep in mind, this was only went into effect January first of this year. Okay. It's brand new. Well, that's and, they, and, and that's why I'm asking there, you there because there are lots and lots yeah. of questions about it from the agencies we represent. I'm not sure how useful it is, uh, uh, but you know, in appropriate circumstances, it may provide a relief valve. Uh, sometimes folks just have to miss meetings too. So, what, <laughs> okay, sure. But what would what I mean? Would you be at this point? In, in violation of the Brown Act, if you if you if you went ahead in in the manner that you just described, if the, if it seemed obvious that you know I broke my leg, I can't I can't care there. I've informed all the members of the board that I can't I can't do that, and the legislative or the body that I'm involved with, you know I I come on Zoom. Is that okay with you guys? And they say yeah, that's okay. Would we would we want to proceed in that way, or would we be risking a violation. What we'd end up doing is pulling out the statute and reading it carefully and trying to implement it. I do that all the time. I end up rereading provisions of the Brown Act all the time because it's long, it's complicated, and sometimes there changes. Most of it doesn't change too much. But uh, you basically start to look at the specifics. That, that's how you, you, you practice law when it comes to a complicated statutory scheme. You don't necessarily know it by heart. And so if contacted about something like that, we're going to pull out that section, we're going to read it carefully, we're going to look at the circumstances, and we're going to advise regarding what steps need to be, take, need to be taken, and how we document that we've done it properly, so that there's a record of it. If right. it requires that the board member or committee member provides the justification that should be in writing then, we want to recite that at the meeting. We want to have a record of it. We, we want to cite to the fact that the Brown Act has yeah, an exception sure, now okay. allowing the board or, or committee uh, to consider this request and take action on it, even though it's not on the agenda. Right. And here's the other things that need to be adhered to with regard to participating through that okay. exception. Well, I, I realize that, you know, with almost any law, there's incredible varieties of hoopla. But uh, uh, I guess what, what I'm what I'm saying then is that in a circumstance like that, let's say I've got a meeting in in two days, I just broke my leg, I can't go to that meeting. Is my first call to you? 
No, I think it's the staff. They're going to contact us if they feel they need guidance. Okay. Okay. Thank we, you. we tend to communicate a lot fairly quickly. <laughs> okay. It's All right. Thank you the, very much. It's the nature of the business. Thank you. My name is Mark Ober. I'm a member of uh, Living Cambria. I have some pretty generic questions. So let's talk about posting agendas. Mm -hmm. Days of old, we didn't have the internet and they were posted everywhere and they were in the newspaper. And what you presented today, it has to be on the district website, mm -hmm. but then it has this freely accessible location. Is there a requirement what that means it used to be let's say in our tiny little town it was posted bloody everywhere and then on newspapers plurality how would you translate that one that would be my first question well typically agencies have a bulletin board at their headquarters that things like that would be posted on i've seen things like that where they will specifically have labels of agendas and things like that I mean, sometimes, uh, in, you know, uh, usually folks go overboard trying to post it and get the word out. Uh, from what I've seen, city clerks and, you know, district clerks and board secretaries and so on. Uh, you know, things are different now because of, of the internet and people are used to going online and looking for an agenda and downloading it and, you know, finding the staff reports and, and so on. And that's, that's how business is done now. You know, before the internet, uh, you would, again, you'd have a, uh, a designated, uh, you know, a board, bulletin board, uh, usually with a glass cover. So things like that. Uh, I, I know there's one out here. I'm sure that was used in that fashion in, in the past. Uh, but, things... but it must it be posted in addition to the internet. I don't believe so. You do not believe so. Okay. So I'd, have, I'd have to go back and reread that. It one. is a question. <laughs> go to staff. Right. Okay, so let's go back to the issue of um, lawsuits. And you were very clear in saying, well, there are certain you shouldn't declare to the public what's going on behind the scenes on lawsuits. Mm -hmm. So let me be specific. What if a lawsuit discussed, let's say, behind, within a closed meeting or addressed that the board of which is aware affects a decision made by that board, which would have to be covered in an open meeting. Well, I guess must so. that must that lawsuit be made public or in some generic term be made public? Lawsuits are matters of public record. Uh, oh, fact, excuse me, let me say, make a threatened lawsuit even. Well, if someone threatened litigation, that threat of litigation would be disclosed either if it was made at a public meeting or the example I gave of the you know, acting general manager getting a phone call and being told, I'm gonna to sue you over such and such. Uh, then, like I said, you would want a contemporaneous document created that articulated that the district is uh, being threatened with a lawsuit for whatever those facts were. And that would then have to be made available to the public and also the way that would be listed on the agenda would be uh, under the exception that it specifically allows for a closed session for threatened litigation. And so the agenda would say threatened litigation citing to that subsection of the Brown Act. And if that- Sort of be out there in, in that yeah, sense. I'm trying to, I, yeah, I, I think you answered my question, but I'm trying to cons consolidate, let's, in your example, if it affected uh, the signing of a new lease or something where that led by that lawsuit, must it be disclosed in conjunction with the board's open meeting agenda item? The, the agenda item would have to be disclosed. It would be on the agenda and the reason for the closed session would have to be disclosed prior to going to closed session. Okay, then let's go to the hybrid meetings if I could ask a third question. So. This CCSD does a great job. I can attend on Zoom. I can ask questions on Zoom. Uh, we have the availability of hybrid. If a hybrid meeting is there, must the public be get granted access 
while they are on Zoom versus those board members who we were discussing previously. So if I'm sitting home on Zoom, just say, which we which is done well here, um, do I have a does the does a board and a, a legislative group have an obligation to give the public access who are on Zoom or uh, utilizing uh, hybrid or must they attend the physical meeting? Well, it depends on what it is. If it's under uh, during an emergency state of emergency under regular uh, 361 or, or, or you know, government code 54953 E, which we're not doing now because there, but at Thank that you. time, there were provisions, there are provisions in that section that speak in terms of the public having to give them access. If there's a disruption, you have to discontinue and so on. However, since we're not doing those meetings, uh, that's really not uh, required at this time. That might be in the future, but and a lot of agencies are doing hybrid meetings, but that's really just to expand public access. And it's not, those hybrid meetings are not this, uh, in the barn. It's just being done uh, as a way, there's, there, are, there is a language in the Brown Act that basically says there's nothing in here that prohibits uh, a legislative body from providing more access. And providing more access, like I said, is a good thing. But there's, it's also, no, there's no requirement to give that access. Is not, that not for your regular in-person meeting. Right. So if there's an in-person, you should go if you now, are blocked. There are in some provisions, fashion. again, that speak in terms of this, you know, AB 2449 has something about needing to provide uh, or discontinue, rather, if the telephonic uh, system you're using is suddenly disrupted, yeah, things that. like that. Uh, so, so it, it but, but for uh, uh, your, uh, um, you know, just regular legislative body is meeting, uh, you know, it's just we're providing additional opportunities for the public to, to, to participate, just like we otherwise have uh, done it by televising the meetings and people can watch on TV. Yeah. And now we're going to give an additional op uh, option of uh, watching it on your computer or on your phone uh, through Zoom, uh, and 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 even you know asking questions. Uh, and it, it it seems like it's the kind of thing where maybe in the future there may be further leg legislation, because it's all become very common. And doing hybrid meetings has become very common. And having you know staff or consultants participate through Zoom. I did the last time I wore my suit. Uh, I did a city council meeting in uh, Arroyo Grande in March of 2022, and they were going through the process of uh, doing this uh, districts for newly elected, you know, for their, their city council members. And they had a consultant. It was an in-person meeting. The city council was there, but the consultant was participating through Zoom. And so he was up on the screen and presenting documents and, and things like that through by screen share shares and so on so not to be a hog but i have two more questions so if you have a open meeting and in your case you're a perfect example you've come here to present on behalf of what is requested by this board does the public always have the right to ask questions of presenters those that are in person certainly have a right to comment there's really no right to, to, to ask, ask questions uh, that i'm aware of and, mm -hmm. and 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 at the same time there's nothing wrong with it you know mm -hmm. providing that right and and wanting to be transparent open and there's nothing wrong with uh, giving the public insights into something like the brown act and then on the uh, no no I, I i think this is great the final thing is early on and i couldn't find it in your presentation you were talking about in open meetings, you know, other communications under background information it almost comes out under freedom of information and asking for documentation. Can you elucidate a little on though? Let's say, I'm not thinking of anything in particular, but let's say there's a, an important decision to be made here. Is the, does the board have, to, a board, not necessarily this one, have to disclose you know, sort of their background documentation. We, 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 it could, it was staff reports, for example, or do, I certainly wouldn't generally come to a supervisor meeting or everything, have access to all those staff reports. But 
it, it's pretty hard to go to an open meeting and have a conversation unless you pre-read staff reports. What must be posted to the public? I don't know in that, that regard, or the, is there? I don't, is there I don't know that the staff reports have to be posted. The agendas have to be posted and have to be search, yeah, sure. searchable. Just about every agency I'm aware of post, has searchable uh, 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 websites that include being able to click and bring up the staff reports. Right. Once those reports or documents uh, have been distributed to the board, they're, they're public records too. Separate and apart from the Brown Act, there's a Public Records Act. Public Records Act is pretty complicated. There's lots of stuff in it. And two years ago, they totally reorganized the numbering of it. And so everything I'm used to has changed as of January 1st of 2023. So I'm having trouble finding those provisions in the Public Records Act. But and we, get, we get requests all the time in Cambria and otherwise you know, for documents uh, relating to uh, uh, you know, what, what's being considered by, by, by the board or, or, or previously considered by the board or, and so on. Um, but uh, you know, the way the, the world seems to work now and I take advantage of it when I'm trying to research something. I know another, I know there's a, there's a thing with, you know, public agency attorneys, and that is we share among our, ourselves and also uh, the stuff you're doing often has been done by another public agency. And so you start to uh, carefully Google and look for, you know, other agencies that have adopted a similar ordinance, for example, and or, or uh, uh, dealt with a similar issue. And, and more times than not, you're going to find on their website, agenda items and things like that, that you're able to download, copy, you know, you know, convert from PDF to Word <laughs> and, and play around with. Uh, you know, so that, that's kind of more the state of the art now than, than before, you know, the internet, since I date back to before so you're the saying internet. To some extent, <laughs> Public Records Act is commingled a little with Brown Act. Is, well, as I mentioned, it, the, state, the state constitution uh, when it was amended in, in 2004, Prop 59, specifically uh, related to both the Public Records Act and the Brown Act. Cool. Thank you very much. Could you perhaps... Uh... Uh, thank you, Jim Townsend again from Lodge Hill here in Cambria. I hope I'm not flogging a dead horse here, um, but I'd like to go back to the title of the um, closed session item on tomorrow's agenda, which is general manager and interim general manager. That's the complete title of the, of the item there. Uh, in your presentation, you noted that um, an agenda needs to contain a general description of each item to be discussed. And uh, on another slide under the authorized closed session items under personnel, there's a number of items that can be talked about in closed sessions, all of which either are or relate to verbs, uh, appoint, employ, evaluate, discipline, dismiss. You could add interview, you could add a few other things to that, but they all involve an action, some sort of an action to be discussed or taken. And, and during the, the last uh, uh, questionnaire, you mentioned that that the uh, closed session items needed to describe the reason for the closed session. And I'm curious as to how any member of the public could read the title of that item, general manager and interim general manager, and be able to suss out uh, what business or actions are gonna be taken or discussed and, and what the reason for that item is on the agenda. I understand the point, and I understand how it could be more descriptive. As I mentioned, there is a section of the Brown Act that sets out what are uh, acceptable descriptions when it comes to closed session items. And uh, Cambria, as other agencies that I'm familiar with, typically will use that language for their closed session items. And they're even referred to as the safe harbor descriptions they may not be as descriptive as you would like. I mean, again, I understand your point and you articulated it very nicely, but we're complying with the Brown Act. Now, what language is that that you're referring to? It's a section of the Brown Act. I can look it up for you afterwards if you'd like. I have a copy of the Brown Act with me that basically sets forth uh, agenda descriptions for various 
uh, uh, types of uh, closed sessions and indicates that using those uh, descriptions is considered substantial compliance with the Brown Act. It'd be great to, to see that. Thank you. So, Good morning, Hi. almost afternoon. Deborah Scott, I'm a director on CCSD. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have two questions. Um, one is on um, the limited response to public comment, and it's under um, a member of the body may refer the matter to staff for information, request to report back, or direct to place a matter on a future agenda. Um, the way that we do it here is that that goes through the chair Mm -hmm. Is that by policy that it goes through the chair, or is that part of the Brown Act? I believe it's uh, the Brown Act. I believe, I want to double check, makes reference to uh, the uh, policies or, you know, rules of the agency. And in this case, I believe that's part of the uh, bylaws of, of the board. That's what I think, too. <laughs> the next one is um, about committees and um Ted Key came and asked questions about that um, before. Um, and I'm, I'm just wanting to clarify to make sure that all of the committees that are our standing committees are being held um, at, in a public place. Is that what's happening now? They should. Okay. Yeah. Right? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Okay. okay. I'm not. I'm not aware that they aren't. I okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, we're not. <laughs> uh, Don Howell. Uh, just two questions. Um, to follow up a little bit on the uh, description for the closed session items, that my what I interpret what you've said is that the safe harbor, harbor descriptions represent the minimum description that would comply with the Brown Act. Mm -hmm. I would I be correct in assuming that a board could choose to be a little more detailed than the minimum description? Certainly. Okay, just so that kind of a same similar answer to what came up two years ago with regard to public comment. If the you know here's what the Brown Act requires as a minimum, but if the board wants to allow more in the way of of uh, public comment or disclosure or whatever, uh, they can. Uh, thank you. Just wanted to get clarified that those are min uh, minimum requirements, mm -hmm. uh, and on public comment itself. Um, <clears throat> I've asked this question before and gotten an answer, but I just I want to hear it again, and I, others might benefit. Um, during general public comment, the question in my mind was uh, twofold: Is are there things that you can uh, tell the member of the public are out of order? As for example, they're straying beyond the uh, purview of the legislative body, for example. But what about a case of the a member of the public uh, making personal attacks, say, at staff in public comment. Can that be limited? It's kind of difficult, to be honest, because beyond what's in the statute, you have First Amendment rights. Where people certainly can say what they want to say publicly. They may be engaging in conduct that could come back to haunt them in terms of slander, defamation, that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, it becomes kind of difficult and troubling when things like that happen because uh, people do have First Amendment rights to, to speak as well. If someone wants to get up and express their opinion regarding a staff member, uh, I guess uh, there's nothing really that can stop them from doing so within their three minutes. So, so just to get clarity on that, so should the comments become obviously defamatory, the chair still has no power to shut them up? Yeah, I, I'm not aware of any mechanism that okay. cleanly deals with those kind of uh, troubling situations that come up from time to time. It, 
thankfully very rare, but yeah, I just thought I would like to ask. Thank you. So, so you mentioned there are meetings that are more intense than others, and generally it is a three minute rule. I've seen it most everywhere. If there's a three minute rule set up, you also mentioned they can limit the total amount of public mm -hmm. comment. Must that done be done before the board meeting and during a board meeting, could they change, shall we say, the in, 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 different individuals' rights to comment at a shorter period or whatever? I suppose it could be done during the meeting. However, since the Brown Act allows it, it does. Uh, okay. I, I, in my experience, the better practice is to let, let people go. speak let let it, it's a public process and it, it may be difficult or painful sometimes or long uh you know my <laughs> i've got a 37 year old daughter who was born on march 4th 1984 no 80 i'm sorry 86 Oops. 86 <laughs> careful yeah who uh was born at two o'clock in the afternoon it was a c-section i was in there with her my wife was all drugged up afterwards and then i went to a council meeting very controversial issue went till two in the morning. <laughs> but you had a nice little thing in the paper afterwards about my daughter her weight and you know doing but, well. But the board could actually change the rules mid meeting, is what I think I heard you say. Ah, boy. The Brown Act allows lim you know having rules and limiting time. It's probably best for those kind of things to be done in advance. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I just I've seen it both ways. So. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Any others? Is it, Haley, were there any uh, questions from the public uh, Zooming? Okay. I guess that's it. <laughs> well, thank you for paying attention and having some fun questions. I'll save my notes for the next time. <laughs>